Okay, so it is 11 o'clock straight up in mountain time. Um, welcome to Ocean First Institute's Fish Friday Harbor Lab Biomechanics and Finding Nemo with Dr. Adam Summers. We are so honored to have him here with us today. Um, and we'll meet him here in just a few minutes. But real quickly, I am Jenna Oliver, the Director of Development at Ocean First Institute. And before we get started, I wanted to share just a little bit about Ocean First Institute for those of you that are new to us. At Ocean First Institute, our goal is ocean conservation through research and education. We're really passionate about the ocean, which you'll see here momentarily, and hope to inspire every one of you to be equally as passionate about the wonders of the ocean as we are. We're also dedicated to educating and empowering young people to become the future leaders in conservation. So we're so excited that you're joining us today. Um, you can also join us in our mission by visiting our website and following us on social media. For the webinar today, please feel free to type questions in the Q&A box um, or in the chat box on Facebook Live, and we'll share your questions with Dr. Summers after his presentation. Now, without further ado, I would like to introduce my boss and friend and Ocean's First Executive Director, Dr. Mickey McComb Kobza, who will share a bit more about today's speaker and topic. Mickey? All right, thanks, Jenna. Um, well, welcome, everybody. It's great to see you. I appreciate you um, tuning in today to this webinar. Um, it is uh, my pleasure to go ahead and introduce uh, a friend of mine, Dr. Adam Summers. Uh, Adam has an amazing career and uh, a job that I think a lot of people are envious about. Um, he grew up in New York City and also in uh, the woods of Canada, and uh, he got a degree in engineering and mathematics. Um, but it wasn't meant to be. He ended up uh, going to teach scuba diving in Australia and met his first professional biologist, and that changed his life. And he came back and he got a master's degree in biology. He got his PhD um, in Massachusetts, and he never looked back. And he um, was so inspired with his past of uh, mechanical engineering and mathematics and biology, and he combined all of these things together and uh, really is inspired in biomechanics. So looking at the mechanical laws um, relating to the movement or structure of living things. And so that is really um, kind of the nexus of where um, Adam's interest lies. Um, in 2001, he founded the Biomechanics Lab at the University of California, Irvine. Um, and then in 2009, he moved out to um, Friday Harbor, um, University of Washington's Friday Harbor Lab. And uh, that is where he is to this day. And he is uh, uh, got a whole cadre of graduate students that work on amazing questions um, relating to fish and lizards and sharks and skates and rays. Um, and Adam has a, a passion about 3D scanning fish, um, all 33,000 uh, bony fish. So he is uh, quite an ambitious um, scholar uh, and uh, publishes uh, broadly in all kinds of journals with his students and colleagues. Um, so it is my uh, pleasure to introduce Adam today to give a talk. Uh, and uh, I'll, I'll go ahead and let you start, Adam. Thank you again so much for being with us. Let's see. I, I don't know if everybody can can see and hear me yet. So wait. Okay, I got some thumbs up. Yeah. Things are looking good. Um, I'm becoming a bit of a Zoom veteran at this point. Um, so hi, my name is Adam Summers, and I'm going to tell you a few different uh, little stories in in the hopes of inter in interesting you in the kinds of things uh, that interest me. And one of the major themes of of what I do is I look to natural history for inspiration for new materials and, and, and new designs for uh, uh, technical solutions to problems like how to stick to things, how to burrow, how to uh, poke holes in things, how to defend against having holes poked in you. And so I thought that I would start with one of the most interesting dives I've been on. I, I've been diving since I was 13 or so, so uh, you know, more than 40 years. And uh, the defining characteristic of dives that are wonderful for me at this point turned out to be, am I diving with my family? Um, so diving with my, my certified daughters, my certified son, my wife, I mean, it just it, it, that's, that's what makes a great dive. But every now and then, I get a chance to do a dive all by myself. 
um, in someplace really neat. And, and in this case, I'm going to show you uh, some stuff from the Socorro Islands. And so I'm going to start a presentation and hopefully give you a little introduction to where I am presenting from. Let me see. Up oh, here it is. And let's hope that you can see that. I can't. Have no idea. Well, we're going to we're going to think that it's good. All right. So uh, yeah, there's a CT scan of a sculpin's head right there in front of you. And I am broadcasting from here, from the Friday Harbor Laboratories, which is the Marine Station for the University of Washington. And in that central panel, uh, my office is right off to the right side. And I'm looking out the window now uh, to see the whale watching boats uh, taking off to look for, for orca whales. And I just wanna tell folks that we have a, a research experience for undergraduates program out here. So you can apply to get paid to come out here if you're an undergraduate. Um, we also have a, a bunch of summer classes. And so you can take uh, undergraduate and graduate classes here. And then we also have a place for people to come and do creative work in all fields. So sometimes that might be biology or physics or, or engineering, but it also might be music or art. Uh, and so you, 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 should, you should look into coming out here because I'll say the, the only drawback to living on a tiny island at a marine station is I'm always trying to, 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 to get more friends out here. All right, so um, before I go any further, I'm just gonna put the folks in my lab up. And this is just, uh, some of the people who've been here for the last uh, little while, um, including graduate students, former graduate students, postdocs, and, uh, and, and uh, visiting scholars. So there's, there's a, a small slice of the people who've been here recently. I'm gonna talk to you first about an amazing place, the Revilla Gigedo Islands. Uh, this is not uh, a recreational dive site in, in any normal sense. Um, first of all, it takes 28 hours to get there. So this is off of Mexico, it's off of Baja California Sur, and it's about 300 miles off the tip of at Cabo San Lucas. And so uh, in, in a typical, very slow boat, uh, dive boat, it takes, it takes more than a day, more than 24 hours to get there. And once you're there, you're in a UNESCO World Heritage Site that only allows five diving licenses per year. Um, oh, apparently you're seeing them in presenter mode, which is a little disappointing. Uh, let's see, how do I stop that? Hmm. Uh, let's see, maybe if I, uh, you know, some days it's hardly worth trying the Uh, I got to start this thing up and then I got to go over to which screen am I sharing? Hmm? Uh, let's see, is that any better? Do you share a screen? Yeah, that's not going to work. Um, that's all right, Adam. I think we can. I think, I think, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not someone who generally there you does go. PowerPoint things. So I think. Oh, there it went again. Just, just going to have to live with. Oh, you mean it worked for a minute? Yeah, it did for a second, but I'm not sure what, what that was. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> it's totally fine. We can, we can see just perfectly fine. It's all good. Okay. Are, are you seeing a shared screen now? Uh, nope. Of course not. <laughs> there we go. We'll get uh, it. Let's see. Problem is I keep losing. There's there's three different screens up here. We love your background. <laughs> that is very cool. Okay, here we go. There Maybe. You go. Okay, are we are we seeing something good? Yeah, we're seeing beautiful. Uh, is it the presentation or is it the presentation of the presentation? I think it's um, the... I'm, I'm going to hit play and see what happens. Oh, you got it. It's Sweet. perfect. Fantastic. Thank you. Okay, so many, many miles off of Mexico, long trip. Uh, not the kind of thing you want to take uh, an 8 and a 12-year-old on, but, but 
I managed to get out there all by myself with a big rig uh, of cameras. And the idea for me was to use this UNESCO World Heritage Site, which is designated that because of it's, it's a congregation site for giant manta rays, manta birostris. And I was bringing a rig underwater that had many, many cameras on it in order to capture 3D motion of these uh, of, of, of these giant mantas. So this is San Benedicto. This is one of the, 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 the biggest of the volcanic islands. Uh, it's also quite new. You can see a brand new lava pot patch over to the right. And uh, here it is uh, from, from the water. And, and this is sort of what we, what we did. We jumped in little tiny inflatable boats. We went a long way from the boat that we were mother shipping from and rolled over the side into an absolutely amazing place where on a typical dive, we would see between 10 and 20 giant ocean mantis. And what I'm getting out of these videos, and so this is where I'm trying to show you how I look at the world is, I don't know if you just noticed, but that animal used its fins entirely independently. Those giant pectoral fins that it uses for swimming it did a beautiful little ballet. I'm just gonna play that again for you and watch how differently it uses the right and left fin. They're both coming down now, they're both coming up, but then the right fin, the one near us, starts to do things completely independently of the one further away. And so I'm interested in trying to understand that flexibility and how that generates propulsion, because if you're trying to build an AUV, an autonomous underwater vehicle, a Manta is a great model. It's got a giant central payload that doesn't move much, you know, so if you're a tuna, uh, the center of the body moves quite a bit. A Manta barely moves, so that's kind of neat. Um, in, in, in watching these things, uh, closely, we learned some really neat things about their sensory biology. So this is a giant ocean manta that's investigating someone. And I want you to look right in the middle of the, of the animal's head. You'll see the cephalic fins, which are curled up. And they're curled up into the swimming position, which is much more hydrodynamic. They're kind of pointy. And now here it comes by me. And as it comes by, watch the cephalic fin, which is right in front of the white spot of the eye, whoop, unrolling, only on one side, only on the side nearest. And then it's gonna roll back up when it passes me. And I thought, oh my goodness, what's going on there is it's exposing its electrosensory system to me to try and to try and see what I'm about. But it turned out that's not at all what's happening because they don't have electrosensory pores. There are no ampullae of Lorenzini out there on the cephalic fins. Um, but what it was doing was probably, and we don't know for sure, we're, we're actually going to model this in a flow tank, was it was redirecting the flow around its head so that it was getting a signal from my presence on the parts of its body that do have lateral line. And so it was, it was basically tuning what it was, what it was feeling about me as it passed by. I also wanted to show you uh, an illustration of what the world was once like. And you have to understand that there's no place on earth that hasn't been hugely impacted by, by humans. Um, we've, we've just decimated the diversity of the world. And I remember being you know, a kid and talking to my grandmother about, um, about, about bird diversity, because although she was not a biologist, she had spent a lot of time uh, in, in the wild looking at birds. And she said that in Florida, when she was a little girl in the early 1900s, the sky was blackened by migrations of egrets. And now if I see 50 egrets in a tree, I'm really impressed. She was seeing tens of thousands of them. And that's just not a sight we see. And so this is just a, a, a view of what a healthy school of tuna looks like. These are little albacore. And, you know, this is just... This is what it's supposed to be like, not onesies, twosies, or groups of 10. This is just a, an open ocean atoll or open ocean volcanic uh, island with a perfectly healthy school of tuna swimming by. So I, I, I kind of delighted in that. And then of course, I'm fascinated when I'm out here in this incredibly remote place and I find science. Uh, if you follow along with uh, 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 
Mickey's uh, programs, you, you, you may have seen something about shark tagging. And one of the kinds of tags that is put in sharks is a tag that records. And that was just the evidence that there is a, a, a transmitter there, a receiver that's receiving all those transmissions. And I was looking at the science and then I looked down and realized I was almost squatting on this young man. So it's a, kind of a neat uh, moray eel that was sitting there. That was fun. Got a great, a great look at his eye. There's another one behind him. All right. So then I I I know that if if you want to tickle Mickey's brain, you so show sharks. And so that's basically why I'm here. Um I, I I'm I'm interested in in sharks and cartilaginous fishes and biomechanics. And so this is Roca Partida. This is probably 40 miles away from uh, where we were in the last dive. It, this is the entire part of the volcanic island that's sticking above water. So there's almost nothing. It has a little split through it. The current is running five or six knots and it's coming from the open ocean. And so when we go under, you're gonna see what it's like in a, in a very undisturbed habitat with probably 250 to 300 foot visibility, humpback whales swimming by and in this case, a very healthy school of black jacks, uh, which are pairing off uh, and, and doing little mating dances, which is kind of fun to see. But we just drop down into this and you can essentially see forever. And one of the things you see on the wall of this are sharks. There's a lot of white tip reef sharks. There's a lot of hammerheads, Galapagos, uh, and um, and silkies. Here's just what it looks like during the day when a bunch of very pregnant female, uh, these are all females, uh, female white tip sharks are just hanging out in a hole in the rock. So I'm just lying down in this hole with them. I like how they sort of jockey around looking for someplace fun and interesting to, to lie down. All right. So um, that's a pretty dive. I use those observations to drive my research program. And my research program involves trying to apply very simple physics and very simple mathematics to biological systems to understand how they work. And so I'm going to tell you a little bit about one of the projects. Uh, and then I guess I'll close with a little bit of the, the facts and fiction in, in Finding Nemo, uh, if, if that works. And I don't know, if you want to keep hearing things, I can tell you how to scan all the fishes in the world. All right, here we go, sticky fish. So that's, again, a sculpin. It's a different project that we're working on. We're trying to understand how those weird spines work that stick out from the side of their head. And I will tell you that this is an example of me spending many, many years seeing something and not really seeing it. I work right next to the sea. My, uh, my office overlooks uh, the harbor and I have intertidal right in front of my office. And so I walk out with prominent ichthyologists at low tide and I flip rocks and we find fishes. And I typically will find one of these fishes. This is a, a Northern clingfish stuck to my daughter's head and I'll hold it out to show them. And then when they're sort of examining its belly, I'll slap it onto their head and take a picture just like this one because it's quite difficult to get the fish off. And so I have a small collection of very nice pictures of prominent ichthyologists with a clingfish stuck to their head. And I did this mostly because I found it entertaining. And then one day as I was struggling to pluck one of these fishes off a rock, I realized that I could not buy a suction cup in the hardware store that would stick to an arbitrarily rough rock from the inner tidal. I just couldn't do it. I mean, you can't buy a suction cup that'll stick to your tiled uh, bathtub. 
you know, uh, bath enclosure. So finding one that sticks to a, a rock is, 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 is impossible. And I couldn't understand how the fish worked. And so that was the inspiration for about 10 years of trying to understand how the fish worked. And now we can build suction cups based on this fish. So does it really work? Well, here, here's a video. Now this is a dead clingfish. This is a completely deceased clingfish and it's lifting a very large rock, you know, hundreds of times its body weight. And it will do this over and over and over again. And that's just sort of the lab standard rock from right in front of the, the lab. So there's, there's proof that this does in fact work, but how? So if you look at these papillae, at these at, at the at the underbelly of the animal, you see this this suction cup, and it's filled. The edges are filled with these lumps, and that's not a recipe for a suction cup that works because you don't want lots of little bumps in a suction cup, do you? You want it to be dead smooth so it interacts very nicely with the surface. So what could be going on? I know, I know, I know what's going on because. I'm a male and I've got lots of testosterone and that means I am never in doubt. Often wrong, but never in doubt. And so what must be going on here is there's a thin layer of tissue that I can't see that's transparent, covering up those little lumps, right? So I stick that on the scanning electron microscope and I find that that is not in fact what's going on. There's the, those lumps are real, they're big bumps. They should not be helping. They shouldn't, they shouldn't be making this a good suction cup. When you look closer though, you see something kind of weird. You see that there are these hairs on top of the lumps. And, and those hairs are very, very similar to the hairs on the feet of geckos. So little tiny gecko feet hairs look similar, but they are substantially different. First of all, they're kind of floppy. You can see they flop all over. They're not perfectly thin and cylindrical. They're kind of changing diameter and they don't have any spatula at the end of them. So they're, they're doing something different. And if you know something about how gecko hairs work, you know that the kind of adhesion there is called dry adhesion. And this can't be dry adhesion because it's happening underwater. How sticky are they and what do they stick to? Well, we tried to stick them to flat surfaces and they stick pretty well. I mean, that yellow bar is how well they stick to a flat surface. And then we made casts of lots of different rough surfaces and boom, it turns out they can stick to any kind of rough surface even better than they stick to a smooth surface. It do, it's not until the surface becomes extremely rough that they can't stick. And and that roughness is about two to 5% of the disc width. So if you had a hand span size cup, you could easily go up the roughest rock you've ever seen. You could go up concrete, you could go up Mount Rushmore in the rain, no problem. So what is happening? Well, to understand what's going on, it turns out you can't patent a critter, but you can steal an idea from a critter and patent that. And so that's what we did. Um, in a normal suction cup, the way it fails is when you pull on it, the edges slide in. And as the edges slide in, the disc that's, that, that the, the suction cup, uh, the, the disc that it's covering becomes smaller and smaller and smaller. That means the material of the disc is being crammed into a smaller and smaller space. Eventually, that material being crammed into the edges buckles. And when it fails in buckling, fluid, water in this case, rushes under and the cup fails. Okay. As an engineer, how do you defend against that? The answer is to defend against buckling, you make something stiffer, you make it thicker. Those two ways defend against buckling. So the problem with that is when you buy a commercial suction cup, it's got thick edges and they're stiff, is well, when you try and stick it to something that has any kind of rugosity to it, fluid just goes right under because the thing is too stiff and too thick to conform to the surface. The clingfish has the exact same problem on a smooth surface. The edges slide in, boom, it buckles and it, it releases. But on a rough surface, remember those little hairs, they attach to the surface. They increase the friction. Now, when you pull in, the edges don't move. 
and you pull and they don't move and you pull more and they still don't move and you pull even more and they still don't move. So eventually they fail in peel. This thing kind of pops off the surface and that's a totally different engineering problem. And so what we've done is changed the way you design a suction cup if you're designing it to stick to rough surfaces. And one of the rough surfaces we're interested in are the orca whales, which are not in fact outside my window right this minute, but that picture was taken from the rock outside my office. And we would like to tag these things with suction cups because poking holes in them uh, seems uh, imprudent given how few of them there are and the fact that one of them actually died from having a, a tag put on it uh, of a fungal infection. So we're interested in manufacturing these cups and using them to stick to whale skin. And here is Petra Ditske with who, who really invented the way of manufacturing these cups with a piece of orca skin in her hands and a lab standard rock uh, hanging from a suction cup that is attached to a string that's attached to another suction cup and we have made that stick for long enough um, that the lab became very difficult to be in because of the rotty smell of the of the blubber. But it'll also hang on a on a on a rugose wet surface for weeks. So we've solved the problem of sticking to to, to rough surfaces. Now, all of the work I did for on clingfish for ten years was done on the one right outside my office because it's right outside my office. They're very easy to get a hold of, and I thought wow, there's like more than 100 species of clingfish. In fact, I've been involved in describing five of them. So there's lots of clingfish. What we should do is check and see how the one we have outside the office does relative to all the ones out there in the world. And so we went to New Zealand, which has a huge number of clingfish um, in one place. So you can catch 10 species uh, in, in, in one locality. And we went there and tried to compare these things, which meant I had to compact my lab into a box and, and bring it to New Zealand. But this is the kind of territory we dove in. Um, and, and that's Tom Turnsky, who's, who's the curator at the Auckland War Memorial Museum. And these are some of the fish we caught. So these are all clingfish. They all, uh, this is a group that attaches to algae and uh, you know seagrasses and things. Then there's a bunch that attach to rocks. And so here we've got some more clingfish that attach to different sorts of things. And this is uh, the Delichthys group. And actually this is Delichthys turnskii attached to Tom Turnsky for whom it was named. Um, this is Modicus, uh, which is a, spe a fish that was only known from about half a dozen specimens and had never been caught uh, alive and whole. And, and on this trip, we managed to manage to do that. Oh, there's Modicus glowing uh, under UV light to show uh, just, just how incredibly cool it is. I just want to give you those two pictures again. This is under regular light. That's under UV light. It does have a, a beautiful pattern under UV light. And here is uh, one of the localities where we dived. This is called Danger Rock. Huge surge. It's like diving in a washing machine. But you really got a payoff. Diving in that kind of territory, you find a little, uh, a little calm spot stuck in the rocks and start grabbing sea urchins and rocks and emptying them into the bags. Good Lord. That is so loud in my ears. And the clingfish are under the rocks and under the, under the sea urchins. And you just shake them off and they end up in the bottom of the bag. And that allowed us to catch dozens and dozens of these really rare clingfish and uh, bring them into the, the War Memorial Museum collection. But before we did that, I did a bunch of material tests on them. So this is a machine that pulls uh, clingfish off of different surfaces. You can see the little boxes full of surfaces uh, there. My daughter made the, this set for me before I traveled because um, mine didn't, don't, weren't really set for, uh, set for mobility. 
And I would come back at night and the whole rest of the team would, uh, would, would sit down and, and eat and drink and I would gather data. And I was uh, talking, you know, saying, calling out my data, and typing it into a computer. And I would say, you know, oh, two Newtons, 2.1 Newtons, 2.22 Newtons. And finally, someone said, what's a Newton? Why do you keep saying Newtons? And I was like, oh, that's a good question. The Newton is a unit of force. And so it's how much force it takes to pull this fish off of the surface. And I said, conveniently, a Newton is about the force exerted on your palm by an apple. So one Newton is about the force on your palm of one apple. And this crowd at the table said, wow. So one of those little tiny fish could lift up an apple. And I'm like, oh, gosh. I mean, yes, I think so. So we tried it. Here's just some habitat pictures. And our trials went quite well. It turns out on smooth surfaces, there were no performance differences. All of them worked just as well. But on rough surfaces, the weed... Uh, the weedy species didn't stick as well as the ones that were used to sticking on rock. The peak suction is absolutely at the theoretical max. And it turns out we were able to really show clearly that five trials gets you enough information to, to categorize things. And like the clingfish from outside my office, you could continue to test them and it would not change the adhesion. So it's purely a mechanism. And here is the world record holder is a tiny, tiny little clingfish, uh, less than a gram, and it's going to lift 1. Uh, 1,236 times its body weight <laughs> because I, I had an apple there, and that is a dead clingfish lifting a lot of weight. That's kind of cool. All right, so I am going to pause here because I think I'm supposed to go 30 minutes, and it's already... 10 30. so i i can pause here and, and we can just uh you're good you can keep going uh if you want to for a few more minutes no problem okay yeah then i'll tell you a couple quick little stories about about finding nemo um and someone asked if i ate the apple and of course i ate the apple i just you know you just rinse it off and eat it i mean it's it's a fish you eat fish don't you i mean i don't but many people do so yeah just cleaned off the apple and ate it all right so I don't know, over 20 years ago now, um, my wife and I lived in Berkeley where I was doing my postdoc and we lived in the basement of a house and it turned out the house was owned by a woman who ran Pixar University. And so at some point she came downstairs and asked if I knew anybody who was willing to talk about fish. And I said, yeah, I, I can talk about fish. Why? Why Why do you need someone to talk about fish? And I said, I, I can't tell you. I, I can't tell you. And I said, well, sign me up. I'll talk to anybody about fish anytime. So I went over to Pixar and I, I gave a, a few hours of chatting about fish and that led to a job on Finding Nemo. So I worked on Finding Nemo for three years uh, and spent an incredible amount of time. They were just magnificent people to work with because they really were interested in having the science drive the story forward. And all these years later uh, with hundreds and hundreds of people bringing up problems with the film, uh, errors. No one has brought up an error that we didn't think hard about. You have to tell lies if you're going to make a movie. And anytime I would get too indignant about a lie we were telling, the, the, the folks there had a, a stock phrase. They'd say, Adam, fish don't talk. It's going to be a very bad movie if the fish don't talk. And that's true, right? So we have to tell some lies. So let's take a look at a couple of the lies. Uh, oh, this one's a fun one. So that's Bruce, right? You all know Bruce. He's modeled on a great white shark. It's a vegetarian great white shark. And right after the movie uh, premiered uh, and the public got to go and see it, my, my nephew went. And so this is my nephew who just graduated from Harvard uh, he's worked in my lab for years and, uh, we, we finally have a paper together, but at this point he's eight and he sends me a note and he says, you no, know, he calls me on his, on his father's cell phone. And he says, uh, Uncle Adam, are those boy sharks or girl sharks? And I said, Dexter, it's, it's Bruce. It's got a deep voice. It's a boy shark. He says, where are the claspers? Sharks have intermittent organs, right? 
So they have these claspers, and probably they were not there in the movie. And you know, people definitely underestimate the perspicacity of young people because they simply would not have expected an eight-year-old to catch that. But uh, if you're interested in sharks from a young age, you'll see something like that. That's something that'll leap out at you. And it did leap out at Dexter, and I'm sure it leapt out at a lot of other people. And they thought, it's Disney's movie. They they removed the claspers so they didn't show any naughty bits. And it turns out that's not at all true. So here's the real story. Uh, there's Bruce. And here's something I didn't know before I, I helped make the movie. Uh, this is a totally digitally animated movie. Nevertheless, there are physical models made of each of the main characters out of clay. I mean, these giant sculpts. And so I walked into the sculptor's uh, studio and Jerome was had off to the side the sculpt of Bruce. And I looked at it. And I'm like, oh, oh no, uh, Jerome. Uh, the, and he's like, you can't talk to me about it. I've gone around and around about it go talk to Ricky. Ricky Nierva is the fellow in charge of, of characters. And I said, but the, and he says, Ricky, down the hall, that's where you want to go. And so I went down the hall to yell uh, about missing claspers. And Ricky saw me come in, you know, I was in the hallway and he said, oh, I've got something to show you. And he had footage and he said, you're here about the claspers. And I said, I am, I am. Bruce has no claspers and, you know, male sharks have claspers. You need to have claspers. And he said, I thought so too. But here's a problem. Look at Bruce. Look at that picture of Bruce. Bruce is a wide shark. Bruce also turns around in the length of the screen. Bruce is a very short shark. He is a short, wide shark. He is basically a spherical shark. And when Ricky animated Bruce with claspers, and Bruce does that quick 180. All you see are these giant things waving around. It, it's absolutely no good. I mean, you, it's totally distracting. It ruins the scene. And I said, wow, okay, uh, that makes sense. You can't, yeah, it's, that's no good. You can't do that. Um, but, I mean, could you maybe just... Um, knock a little off the clasp and he said hi i thought of that and here's what it looks like <laughs> and, and then he did it again but with smaller claspers and you still really saw them except you sort of saw them and went oh something bad happened there so the claspers are there simply because bruce is too short and fat to have claspers now uh i did say that that pixar let the science drive the story and uh that was really true. I mean, over and over again, they just asked me to come in and tell fish stories, tell stories about neat science having to do with fish. One of the very first stories I told them was about uh, deep sea angler fishes. Deep sea angler fishes, they're not that big. Little guys, line of friny, half of friny, things like this. And it's very dark where they live. They don't live on the bottom. And so there's a lot of volume where they live. They can swim around a lot, but it's totally dark. When a male angler fish develops, it's basically a tail and a nose. And that nose is what it uses to swim around and try to find the scent of a female. When it finds the scent trail, it swims down the scent trail. And at this point, if it finds the female, the female's so big, that it's going to easily outswim this little tiny male. If it, if it finds the female, it cannot afford to miss this opportunity to mate. But the female's likely not in any mood to mate. Not ready. It's not the time. So the male bites the female, bites onto her side, and never lets go. Her body grows into his body, and he becomes a testicular parasite attached to her bloodstream flesh grows into flesh and when the female angler fish ovulates and produces eggs that same hormonal surge causes all of the testicular parasites attached to her to produce sperm i told that story <coughs> and they immediately decided they had to have an angler fish in the movie somehow and so 
here it is. Now, if you go frame by frame through that scene, that giant female anglerfish has testicular males attached, these testicular parasites. I just love that not only did they add the, the, the males, they add, add the anglerfish, they also added the males. And so that's just, I, I just think that's spectacular. All right, so um, I've got one last thing, and this is directly uh, up Mickey's alley, and this is this is anchor. This was just a tragedy. Um, I walked in as the first art for for anchor came up. Anchor's a hammerhead shark, and I'm going to ask you, what do you see that's just wrong with that fish? And the thing that you see is very likely quite different than the thing that Mickey sees, and different than the thing that I saw when I walked in. So. There's that hammerhead shark, and you might be upset about where the jaws are, how narrow the neck thing is. That's just that's those are tiny lies. Those are those are little misleading things that you need to have in order to act. But here's the real problem. In a hammerhead shark, oh my my, my typing's on several lines now because of this change in aspect ratio. In a real hammerhead shark, the eyes are out on the ends of the hammer, right? That's where the eyes are, just like in anchor. But the nostrils are also out on the ends of the hammer. And the moment I saw anchor, I'm like, why have you put the nostrils there? That's no good. I'm just going to ask you quietly and without a lot of screaming to take the freaking nostrils and move them out where they belong. And this is what they did to me. They said, no, we're not going to do it. Look, why not? This is a cheap and easy fix. You know, they're just dots. Boop, done. And they said, what's that? And I looked at those pictures and I thought, I, said, I, I don't know, what is it? And they said, what is that? And I said, oh, that's the face. Oh, that's a face too. They said, yeah. You don't see a face if it's eyes, nostrils, mouth. You only see a face if it's eyes, nostrils, mouth. We have to lie. I was very distressed. But those are the kinds of lies that end up having to get told. So with that, I will, I will stop and uh, and and take any questions you might have, and let's right. see. I'll stop well, my sharing and move my head around. Here we go. There we go. Okay. <laughs> All right. That was amazing. Thank you, Adam. Um, I just have to have one comment that I think is so funny. We had another guest on a while ago who created the megalodon um, uh, sculpture that's in the Smithsonian. And he also had issues with the claspers. <laughs> it was so funny that you mentioned the same thing. He had a big argument about having a male or a female, and uh, it turns out they ended up having a female and no claspers in the Smithsonian Megalodon. Uh, yeah, so funny, funny coincidence. Um, well, I'm sure uh, we've got a few minutes here, so um, I would love uh, to take some questions. Jenna, do you see uh, any questions that we want to uh, give to Dr. Summers right now? I, yeah, I could I see one in the webinar. Is that is yeah, that the chat? Uh -huh. Okay. So the question was, when I talked about a dead clingfish, uh, what did that mean? Did it die clinging? No. So 
we were collecting these for the museum. So when we catch them, we euthanize them. And so they're dead fish. They're totally dead fish. And I was using freshly dead fish to stick to things. They didn't die clinging. They died in anesthesia when we collected them. So the, the reason that's important is that the clinging effect has nothing to do with something the fish is volitionally doing. It has to do with some property of the mechanism in, on the belly of the fish. Um, and so uh, then someone wants to know if the graduate classes will be in person this summer. And you know, every other summer I teach a, a uh, fish class in biomechanics and it was supposed to start in our summer A term, which was canceled, but our summer B term was not canceled. And we are the only part of the University of Washington campus that's holding in class uh, holding in-person classes. And so I will be teaching that starting in a few weeks. And, and the way we're going to make it happen is the students are asked to come a week early. They're going to isolate at the labs uh, for a week. And at day four, they're going to get tested for COVID. And it'll take another three or four days for their results to come back. And when they come back, if they're negative, we will then have groups of uh, six that associate freely and uh, and, and so we basically keep everyone from seeing anyone else for the whole duration of the class. And you may say, oh, that's terrible. I mean, you know, not being able to see anybody for the duration of the class. I think it won't be that much different than it usually is because typically the classes uh, that I teach, this is a five week class, it gets you nine graduate credits. And in that time, you don't have time to chat with anybody. You're spending a lot of your day and all of the days of the week getting stuff done. So I don't think that it's gonna be a huge adjustment in terms of, of dealing with the class. That's great. Do you still have room in that, in that graduate class? No, no, the class is full. Uh, you know, the, another group teaches it in the off year. So next year it'll be taught by uh, my friends, uh, Paolo Dominici and John Stephenson, and it'll have a, a swimming focus. And then I'll teach it again in two years. I teach it every two years. Fantastic. Hey, I have a great question um, from Ethan. Um, well, actually, no, it's not from Ethan. It's from someone else. Um, what is the next burning scientific question for you, Dr. Summer? Well, there's there's a lot of things going on in, in my lab all the time. And, and actually, I, I think that that's why I love this job is because the burning question gets to be the one that, you know, is, is, is most exciting right this minute. And right this minute, we've got a bunch of people working on uh, how armor works. And so it turns out that there are some fishes that are incredibly well armored, and yet they're still fairly mobile. There are some that are not well mo that are not mobile. Uh, box fishes and things are just you know they're shoe boxes made of bone. But things like poachers are really well armored, and yet the armor is articulated in such a way that they're quite maneuverable and they're they're pretty fast relative to other fishes closely related to them. So I'm interested in how you design armor that allows you to both be quick and also resist the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune. Uh, and so we're, we're working a lot on that. We're also looking at how fish burrow and as a sort of long-term project, our, our entire facility is devoted to this idea of trying to CT scan every fish in the sea and make those scans freely available for anyone to do anything they want with. So we're, we're trying to generate huge amounts of publicly available data. Right now we're uh, um, at uh, 218 terabytes of publicly accessible CT data of things that qualify as fishes. How many fish would that be that you've uh, CT scanned? Uh, I just I just looked it up because that was part of the presentation uh, that I was going to give you folks if I had an hour. I sort of misunderstood how much time I had. Uh, we're at 4,400 species wow. and almost 11,000 specimens. That's amazing. So if my colleagues scanned diversity, we'd be at 11,000 species. But instead, some, some people like to scan 200 of one species to answer a question that's at the population level. So, yeah. That's fantastic. Well, um, uh, Jenna, do you see any other questions? 
I am actually scanning the Facebook page right now. And um, Nina did have a question again about the sticky fish. She just wanted to know if he was still moist. Yes, they're, they're tested in water. Yeah. And then Adam, I have one question for you. So um, you have uh, children and you're a scuba diver and you love the exploration of the sea. Um, I, and, and I also uh, share that passion uh, with you. I'm wondering if there's anything you can say in spite of being in the sixth mass extinction event right now to you know some of the people on this webinar who are very excited about science and thinking about careers or pursuing some dreams. Are, do you have any advice that you might share with some of these people on trying to value nature and science and, and uh, any comments there? No, I, I don't, I, I think it's a mistake to be pessimistic. Um, I, I think that change is generated on the ground by small commit, committed groups who are full of passionate people. And the way you end up in one of those groups is by spending time uh, in the sea and making observations and immersing yourself in natural history. And so for me, I think that the most encouraging thing is, you know, I've got an, an eight year old who is certified to dive to a dozen feet and he spends every minute of his life wishing he was underwater. And, uh, you know, he free dives constantly in this terrible water. I mean, the water out there is like 14 degrees C. It's terribly cold. And he just is underwater all the time. My daughter has now dived in, in five oceans. Uh, you know, she's fully certified and, and, you know, she also is just completely immersed in the natural world. And I think that making that happen, whether it's something you do on your own or something that you do through one of these organizations like Kids Sea Camp, uh, which is just a fabulous way to get kids into diving. Um, I, I just think that's, that's the goal is to get people out into nature and looking hard at nature. Cause when you know it, you'll love it and you'll, you'll work hard to preserve it. And that's, that's, and, and working hard to preserve it at an individual level makes a difference. I think that's the, the, the biggest thing is it's, this is not a pessimistic time. This is a time when we can make a real difference. Wow, thank you for sharing that. That's uh, very inspiring and I, I uh, share your sentiment. Uh, I have an 11 year old who's a scuba diver and uh, it's transformative and it opens doors and the imagination and the passion uh, for conservation. So thank you for sharing that uh, with us. And I think um, I'll give you one last chance to say goodbye to everyone, but I would just like to personally thank you uh, Dr. Adam Summers for being here with us today and sharing your expertise. You're a great storyteller and you have an amazing career and you have impacted so many young scientists and launched careers that have had a big impact on the world. So I'm so personally grateful for all that you've done and for who you are. And uh, I know your children will be amazing um, additions to this beautiful blue planet we all love and want to protect. So thank you so much for being with us today and I'll leave it with you for last comments. Oh, thank you for inviting me, Mickey. It's, it's always a joy. And I'm sad I won't be seeing you at uh, a scientific meeting this year, but maybe next year. <laughs> well, for sure. Um, love all to right. see you again. Um, thank you all so much for joining us today. And uh, uh, if any other questions, let us know. Yeah, we had some final comments, so thank you too, to Adam. So. Okay, thank you all. Bye-bye.